Good afternoon, everybody. We are so glad that you're with us today to um, share in this webinar. We're, we're excited to talk to you about the Physical Activity Alliance and introduce you to the work uh, or, or um, have this ongoing conversation with you about the work that we're doing. We have uh, great panel of speakers today to take us through the webinar. And I am going to introduce myself. I'm Laurie Witzel. I am the Strategic Senior Advisor to the Physical Activity Alliance. I'm also Vice President of Policy Research for the American Heart Association. And the American Heart Association is serving as an administrative backbone to the Alliance. Um, we're just so glad to be part of this collaborative work going forward. I'm going to just quickly present the mission and vision of the Alliance and some of the high level work that we're doing. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Monty Ward, our president, uh, who's then gonna pass it to other members of our executive committee. So thanks again for joining us today. And we really look forward to the, to the discussion. Please feel free as we go through the webinar to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A. We'll monitor those and we may uh, answer or address some of them. Uh, as we go through the webinar, but we'll definitely leave time for discussion and conversation at the end as well. So if we could go to the next slide, um, I would just want to mention that, you know, we all came together in this collaborative. It's been, we're, we're coming on to our one year anniversary of the Physical Activity Alliance being stood up as a 501c3. So that's really exciting. And that's one of the reasons for the webinar today is to be able to celebrate some of the accomplishments we've had over this last year and talk about our vision uh, going forward. But this all came about because uh, two years ago in Washington, DC, the physical activity community came together to talk about the importance of um, building out more collaboration across our space and the opportunity to work together and just how much more powerful we can be when we come together um, as, a, as a unified uh, alliance. And so it was a smaller group of us that continued to meet over that next year. And uh, we brought together three organizations initially, the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance, the National Physical Activity Society, and the National Coalition for Promoting Physical Activity, and brought them together into this 1501c3. And the mission uh, is, of course, uh, of the Alliance is to lead efforts to create, support, and advocate for policy and systems changes that really enable all Americans to enjoy physically active lives. And so, you know, just coming together as a collaborative, as an alliance around that mission is really powerful. And if we could go to the vision next, um, you know, we really want to see an active and healthy nation where the opportunity for physical activity is easily available to the daily, in the daily lives of all Americans. And so really that's gonna happen through policy systems and environment change. And it's why it's so great to combine the National Physical Activity Plan, which is our strategic roadmap with the policy change work of our policy sector uh, with the professional development that Alan leads and, and those important voices for the policy change and systems change work that we're doing. And so you can see the board level organizations here that have committed to a leadership role within the Alliance. It's a significant financial commitment, but also a, a commitment of time and energy and collaboration. And we're incredibly grateful to these organizations for making that commitment and helping to craft a strategic vision for the Alliance. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, you know, just want to be able to highlight, you know, as, as we come together, what I would say is that, you know, we have this wonderful group of leadership organizations, but then we have so many other organizations and individuals and leading researchers who are part of the other committees of the work of the Alliance. And so even if not at the board level, uh, contributing to the National Physical Activity Plan or the Policy Committee or the work that Alan's doing that he'll be talking to you about today. Um, it's just so critically important. And it's really that in-kind contribution of everybody um, that uh, is really gonna make things happen. So as I said, you know, we're really combining the deep expertise in policy advocacy, research, leading researchers in the field, 
uh, the roadmap that the plan provides, the National Physical Activity Plan provides with the workforce development. And making that a seamless connection is, is one of the powerful attributes of the Alliance. Uh, and then, um, you know, as we said, just, you know, as you think about the policy change continuum, you know, you have to build through policy research and development to your campaigns, you know, to your lobbying activity, to your educational activity with policymakers. Uh, you have to do the media advocacy and the grassroots voices. Uh, that, that all can happen now because we're one organization. And we really want to engage with researchers and public health professionals because their expertise informs the policy systems change. We are about evidence-based policymaking. And so making that connection with the researchers who are at the top of their field with the policy change that we, we, um, where we're trying to make the greatest public health impact uh, is really critical. And so we wanna focus in on those policy and systems changes that are gonna make the most impact, both health impact and equity impact. And then we really want to continue to develop out the continuing education for professionals in public health, education, and beyond. So if we can go to the next slide, I just want to highlight some of the key initiatives that we have within the Alliance. One, as we said, is the National Physical Activity Plan. It's an ongoing process to communicate the plan out, but also to regularly revise and update the plan. And then we're working on a really important physical activity surveillance project with the Health and Innovation Collaborative and the National Academies um, of Medicine. So that's been important work and we look forward to being able to highlight that for you later in the year. Continuing to work on the public policy change that Monty's gonna talk to you about and connected to that, the congressional briefing, the congressional physical activity challenge that we just finished with members of Congress and staff and building out um, the the uh, caucus, the physical activity caucus, um, doing the professional development, the certificate program, and supporting the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Active People Healthy Nation Initiative, which is to get 27 million more people more physically active by 2027. And CDC has built out a wonderful network of partners and we're supporting that work and continuing to build those collaborations that we see are so important across the physical activity community. And finally, we've unveiled our It's Time to Move campaign, which is one of the major initiatives of the Alliance. It's a, going to be a multi-year project. Um, it's got multiple prongs to it, but what we're trying to accomplish is to build on the important work that many organizations have done already to really empower healthcare providers to seamlessly integrate physical activity, clinical measures into patient care and patient care delivery. And we're really focused on the policy environment of that work. So that's really, it's a multi-pronged strategy where we're gonna be engaging with the HL7 process, the Office of the National Coordinator, CMS, the American Medical Association with CPT codes, and other quasi-governmental organizations like NCQA and NQF. So that's where we're spending a lot of time with the Alliance to really make that happen because we know making that clinic to community connection uh, is, is a really important way to foster physical activity across the population. So at this point, I'm really excited to turn things over to Monty Ward, the president of the Physical Activity Alliance, and he's gonna take us through his presentation, his part of the presentation. But while I do that, I'll also keep an eye on the Q&A and chat just to see if there are any questions we can answer as we go along. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. And Monty, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. Uh, and as Lori mentioned, uh, my name is Monty Ward. I'm the president of the PAA for this year. Uh, I, uh, in my day job, I, I represent the American College of Sports Medicine, and I handle their government affairs work for them. Let's go to the next slide. As, as Lori mentioned, you know, the PAA, you know, for us at ACSM, we're, we were very excited to be able to support the Physical Activity Alliance because it was an opportunity for all these organizations to come together, all these different organizations that were out there doing a lot of the same things, but you know, all had different goals. But we were very pleased to be able to have one organization that could act as one voice on Capitol Hill with the administration and with the other policymakers that are out there. Uh, and it, so we were very pleased to be able to help support that. Uh, as we come, you know, close out this one year mark for the PAA, we put put together a list of accomplishments that we've got so far. And, and as you can see, I mean, it's 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 lengthy and it's 
these are just the highlights of it. I and mean, we've had a, a bunch of other small wins in there too. But as we go through this, we can see that all the different things we've been able to accomplish as one voice, as one organization, trying to get people more physically active, whether it be creating a policy agenda, working with CPT codes with the AMA, uh, doing congressional briefings, uh, revitalizing the uh, Congressional Physical Activity Caucus, uh, and, or you know, our wildly successful uh, Physical Activity Challenge. Uh, we had a great partner in my zone who helped us be able to figure out the logistics of that, uh, but we had a number of congressional staff who participated in that physical activity challenge so that we can really show the importance of physical activity. And I think uh, we won't uh, brag on who the winners were in, in this uh, briefing, but uh, uh, it was a, a very great event and we're happy that we were able to sponsor that. Um, you, we've launched position papers and, and we've had joint statements on, on physical activity uh, that we've launched with other organizations. But all these different things that we've accomplished together is, is because we've operated as one voice, as one organization really kind of focused on physical activity. Um, next slide, please. But we need more help. I mean, if, if your organization isn't involved or if you're looking for a way to get more involved and, and really kind of advocate for physical activity, um, we really need your help. There's many different ways uh, to be able to get involved with the PAA. Uh, as, as Lori mentioned, there is a financial commitment to, to be on the, in a leadership role and to be on the board, but there are other ways you can be involved, whether it be part of the National Physical Activity Plan, uh, part of our quarterly calls for our advocacy efforts. Uh, there's many different ways to get involved. We would, we would prefer to have you involved in a leadership role so you can be active and, and that you, so you can um, have a voice into how we act and how and things we advocate for, um, but uh, we will take any kind of help we can get as long as we get people to, to advocate for physical activity. You can see that there's an email address there on, this, on your screen, or you can go to our website and contact us that way, or you can contact any one of our, our panelists here, myself included, to be able to find out more information about it. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And, and wanna talk about policy and advocacy. In addition to being the president of the PAA, I'm also uh, the chair of the policy sector. And as part of that, um, I'm in, involved with creating the policy and the advocacy that we do as an organization. Uh, next slide, please. One of our things that when we as an organization, we were setting out to figure out what we wanted to do as an organization and when it came down to advocacy, we wanted to make sure that we were not stepping on the toes of our members and not stepping on the toes of our other organizations, but we wanted to help support them and the things that they were doing. But we also wanted to help drive where there might be gaps in advocacy that we could really take the lead on. And so we really kind of put, to, put together a good measure. If you go to our website, you can see what our whole policy agenda is. But I wanna highlight just a few things today uh, that we've been working on. Now, one of the main things we've been really working on is, is, is to try to get physical activity assessment, prescription referral in the healthcare system whether that be mandating through CMS and that, that uh, they would be able to cover and pay for um, a, a physical activity prescription um, or, or any other thing that might be involved in that prescription or referral. We want to make sure that our exercise professionals are uh, paid for and covered by the things that they're doing in, in the healthcare system. Lori also mentioned the HL7 process. That's a way to standardize and measure for physical activity in EHRs. And we are working with that process as part of our it's time to move campaign. But we have found that if we can be successful in that, I think it'd be a, a big driver in, in helping to get more people physically active. And finally, we, we want to work to, to allow remote patient monitoring and virtual delivery. Uh, uh, next slide, please. You know, I mentioned that we don't want to step on the toes of other organizations that might be working on certain issues. And these are kind of these issues that we're talking about. We are helping to support these bills to be able to move them along, uh, but they are bills that uh, are very important that, that help promote physical activity. The first one is the Promoting Physical Activity for Americans Act, uh, introduced in the House and Senate, S-1301 and H.R. 2904. Uh, they both were introduced with bipartisan support. Uh, that bill would, would require the Secretary of HHS to pr produce a report every 10 years, guidelines on how to be physically active. Right now they are doing that, but it's not required. So this would codify that process and, and make it so they would have to do it every 10 years. Uh, the bill on the Senate side was passed out of the Senate committee, Senate Health Committee just recently. And we've heard that uh, they're trying to make efforts to be able to hopefully get it on the Senate floor passed by UC uh, this week or next. Uh, so we're very excited. This might be something we can get moving and, and then take it to the House side from there and really work it through that process. 
Uh, on, the, uh, on the next bill, the FIT Act, Personal Health Investment Today Act, introduced by Representative Ron Kine, Mike Kelly, Senators Murphy and Thune on the Senate side, S844, HR3109. This would allow uh, individuals to be able to use their health savings accounts, their flexible savings accounts, to be able to pay for preventive measures, whether it be buying equipment that they can use to be able to get physically active, joining leagues, uh, whatever it might be. This would allow you to use those pre-tax dollars so that you can save some money. We, you know, we've learned that uh, with everything that's going on, that uh, costs are a big issue when it comes to physical activity. And this is a way to overcome those cost problems so that you can save a little money by using your pre-tax dollars. Uh, the other bill is the GEMS Act, uh, Gym Mitigation Survival, uh, introduced in the House and Senate side now. It was just introduced in the House for a long time, but now just recently introduced in the Senate. But this would create a fund to be able to help revitalize the health and fitness industry. Uh, it, and it would allow for clubs to be able to apply for these, these funds so they can keep their gyms up and running. Uh, and the House side has 132 co-sponsors, which is great, but we need more to be able to get more people uh, as co-sponsors listed on the bill so that we can uh, get that bill moving through the process. Next slide, please. Some of the other things we're working on and just in general, uh, the transportation reauthorization bill, uh, that's starting to get some tractions here in the House and Senate. You're starting to see some action there. Um, and we're very excited about the, the chances for, especially the transportation alternatives program. Uh, you know, it was funded about $850 million at, at currently in the program, but we're seeing in both the House and Senate versions and the bills that have been introduced that those, uh, that fund has been increased or will be increased over the, uh, the term of, of the bill. And so we're very excited that there's opportunities for people to be able to get source of funding for biking and walking programs, safe routes to school, all those different things that kind of work within the transportation reauthorization bill, that program would be able to fund those things. And, and so to be able to increase funding for that, we're very excited about that, that potential for that bill. Another one that we're advocating for is, is for the, through the appropriations process, uh, additional funding for the CDC Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity. Uh, you can see the number there, $125 million. Uh, we're really, really working on the Active People Healthy Nation program. That's a great initiative from CDC to get 27, people, 27 million people more active by 2027. Uh, and that's a, a, an initi initiative that we really support and, and think it's be ben beneficial to the American public to be able to get people more active. Uh, finally, more funding for the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. Uh, we're looking to increase that funding as well. Um, I mentioned earlier about CMS coverage for physical activity prescription. That's a, a, a top of our list. It's, it's, a, it's a big undertaking, but it, and it's a long-term undertaking, but I think we're very excited about the possibilities as, as we move forward on that. And finally, we're really about you know, physical activity promotion. When it comes to anything we're advocating for, uh, we really want to be there to be able to advocate for physical activity promotion, whether it be in the military where retention and readiness is sometimes an issue because of the lack of physical activity within our recruits, or just getting people more active in school, whether they play in sports and doing PE in school, um, or just in the rec programs that are out there. We want to be able to promote physical activity in all spaces that we can. Next slide, please. And with that, I will turn it over to Alan Beck uh, to take on professional development. Alan, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Monty. Hello, everybody. My name is Alan Beck. Um, I am the chair of the professional development sector of the Physical Activity Alliance. Um, in my day job, I work at Washington University in St. Louis as a project manager. Um, today, I'm going to provide a brief overview of our mission goal and current activities, and then go a little more in depth about our certificate timeline and goals. So the next slide, please. As you can see here, our, our mission is to provide the field of physical activity educational opportunities. Our goal in that is to disseminate information to the physical activity field as a whole. Um, we, we were born from the National Physical Activity Society where we really focused on physical activity practitioners, but now we're gonna also survey practitioners along with researchers, um, advocates, policymakers, any other groups that need to be um, involved in this, um, in this mission. We're going to perform webinars to satisfy the needs of the field of physical activity, which is what we're doing today, and then develop and maintain a professional certificate. So the next slide. So, so our first accomplishment is this webinar. You can put the next one up too, all three bullet points up. 
Um, our first accomplishment is this webinar. It has taken some time to kind of get our ducks in a row, determine what software we want to use. You know, however, a lesson learned from the pandemic for us at least was Zoom has is pretty much everywhere now. Everybody seems to use it and it's relatively easy to use. So we've chosen this platform. Um, the beginning stages of survey preparation, you know, we, we've looked back at what the National Physical Activity Society had and their, their surveys, and we're currently adapting the survey to our new audience. We're having a much broader and larger audience. Um, as I said before, we focused primarily on um, practitioners before, but now with the Physical Activity Alliance, our, our audience has gotten much larger, which is a good thing. We're all, you know, we had all of these various entities you know, rowing the same direction, but we were all in different boats. Now we're all in the same boat with the advent of the Physical Activity Alliance. And the last thing is um, adapting the Physical Activity and Public Health Specialist certification into a certificate program. And a, a little history here, ACSM and the National Physical Activity Society years ago started this certification. Um, however, as, as time has gone on, um, there have not been enough people taking the certification to even make it financially viable, which is common with other specialty certifications. Um, one example of a, a certification that's been transitioned was the Certified Inclusive Fitness Trainer that's been transitioned to a certificate program. In discussing with uh, various faculty members across the country, especially since we've become this new organization, um, we've learned that it's common practice to have used the certification before to create course, um, either a course or coursework with the intention of having students take the certification after they complete the course or coursework. However, there was some disconnect there whereby very few students actually would take the certification thereafter. So next slide, please. So a little bit of a timeline for you. So June, 2021, which is right now, um, currently we're working on putting presentations together based on the foundations of physical activity and public health book. Um, honestly, putting the presentations together is really the easy part um, of the whole entire process. It's basically like creating a, a class. You know, we've all done this before and create, created PowerPoint presentations and all of that. Uh, next slide. Our goal for October of 2021 is to have all permissions granted uh, for use of any materials we need to use within those presentations we create. So putting the presentation together is pretty easy, but making sure we have permissions is the, the difficult part of that. And we have to ensure we have a systematic way of tracking um, what slides have various um, whether it's images or charts or what have you, and then, and then making sure we have an actual permission to use that uh, throughout the entire presentation. Next slide. January of 22, uh, 2022, pardon me, was our initial goal to have our go live. However, um, we plan to have all presentations recorded by then. Uh, once everything's recorded, we're, we're not really done just yet. Uh, next slide. Between January of 2022 and June of 2022, that gives us some buffer to be able to make sure we get all of those requirements done. It also allows us, uh, part of the process is to have the professional development folks go through the entire certificate program to make sure everything works well, it makes sense, you have proper transitions, no spelling errors, that kind of stuff. Because once it goes live, you can't really pull it back that easily. But in June of 2022 is when we have it set to go live on the American College of Sports and Medicine's Learning Management uh, System site. Next slide. That's fine. Okay. Um, so our short-term goal is to get the certificate up and running. <laughs> I know that seems like an obvious one, but... The Endeavor is a huge, massive, heavy lift, uh, especially in our case for an all-volunteer group. Other certifications that have transitioned to a certificate program have hired full-time project managers to oversee the entire transition, which is costly, fifty dollars to $100,000 to do all of that. And we're not going to pay that much. We have volunteers who are motivated and getting the work done as we speak. A midterm goal that we have 
we'd like to be able to add in continuing education credits or units uh, for folks who are already certified, whether it be um, fitness certifications, public health certifications, health education certifications, just being able to allow that as they take the certificate to be able to get the CECs or CEUs for it. As I mentioned previously, in our discussions, uh, we found many faculty members use the physical activity and public health specialist certification as a framework for their courses. Therefore, we would like to be able to allow others, so those faculty members, to, to be able to grant the certificate down the road. Again, it's kind of a, a midterm goal for us. And then a long-term goal, we would like to establish enough interest that we could go back to ACSM a few years from now and go back to a full certification. Um, you know, one idea we have is to maybe use this, this new um, organization. We have so much of a larger reach than we did before to put that on job postings. You know, make it, you don't have to have it as a requirement. Maybe a preferred is to have the certificate. So making it um, more kind of get the carrot at the end of the stick to be able to allow people to show that, they, that this is valuable in the, their careers going forward. And the next slide. So I wanna uh, extend a special thank you to all the folks who are on the Professional Development Steering Committee. I would be lost without all of them. I sincerely appreciate uh, their assistance and these endeavors, especially the certification. As I said, it's a really big lift. And the final slide is if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me, put things in the chat. I don't know if I have anything yet. Are there any questions for me? in the chat. Hey, Alan, there are two questions in the chat. Um, okay. The first is how can we get involved with leading webinars, creating edu educational content and reaching upcoming leaders in the field? So you can email me, my email address is on the screen. That's a good one. I'll, I'll type it in after my, my portion of the presentation. Um, to reach out about leading webinars. We'll be asking at the end of this, I think tomorrow, Ayana, if I'm correct, we're gonna have an email going out with a survey of um, potential webinar topics you might be interested in. You can select as many as apply to your interest. Uh, and you can also fill in the blank um, if you have other things that we didn't list there than anything else you'd want us to know. And that survey will come back to me so I'll be able to see so you can put your information in there at the open text field. And then the second question is, are you planning to make presentations accessible to people with disabilities, vision or hearing? Yes, uh, I, we're trying to make that as accessible to everybody as possible. When it, that's part of going through and making, ensuring that everything is working correctly, kind of the, the pilot testing of everything is ensuring that it's accessible to every single person. Um, other questions that aren't in the chat that I wanna make sure I point out, um, three common questions that I get. Um, a person may say, I have my certification now, the physical activity and public health specialist. What happens to it? As long as you maintain your continuing education credits, you're able to keep that as a certification. It doesn't go away. If you let it lapse, then once it's gone, it's gone. Um, the second question that's most common is what is the cost of the certificate going Certificate going to be, we're looking at around $150 for the entire um, educational content. It really depends heavily upon how, uh, how long the certificate takes to complete, um, which then leads to my final question I get is how long will it take to complete? The recommendation from ACSM is to keep it between four and, and six hours in the entire uh, duration. Any other questions for me? Pilot, we have. As of right now, a question came in. Sorry. Well, will you have people pilot the certificate program? If yes, will you be asking for volunteers? As of right now, we're just going to pilot it with the folks that I had listed on the previous slide, the people that are involved with the certificate. Not everybody that was listed there is working on the certificate specifically. Mostly, like a, a couple of folks out of that list are. Um, so, as of right now, we're not looking for other volunteers. To clarify, the certificate program replaces the exam. So it replaces the certification, not 
the exam. There will be, after each chapter, our plan right now at least is to have a chapter we go through and then like a short quiz and then a comprehensive exam at the end of it. Again, it's a certificate and not a certification. There are, there are distinct differences between a certificate and a, a certification. A certification, you have to or in CEU, CEC, to show that you're upholding this and it's gonna require knowledge, very specific knowledge, skills, and abilities to where a certificate is a little lesser amount where it's more about just the completion of it overall. You are welcome. <laughs> I saw a thanks pop up in the question and answer. Any other questions for me? If you have other questions, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to answer in that way too. Or if you have ever any comments or thoughts, I can, I'll pop on a Zoom call with you. We're all used to Zoom now. Ah, question, good question. I might have missed this. How is marketing of this going to roll out? Um, I think it says in universities, organizations, et cetera. That's a big benefit of our physical activity alliance is we have a much larger network to get the information out. You know, if I had talked to you about the um, certification, you know, two years ago when we were trying to figure out kind of what do we do with this, there wasn't a lot of marketing. I mean, it was out there. It was on the ACSM website, but we weren't doing a lot of active marketing, targeted marketing to where now because of the larger network that we have, we're able to send that out via listservs through this network we have here on the Zoom uh, call. So we have a much larger reach and we're going to come up with a, a marketing plan for this as it rolls out. We're not just going to put it on ACSM's learning management site and say, good luck. We're, we're going to actually push this out to make sure people are aware that this is, this is out there. I think it'll be popular in the beginning and then maybe come down a little bit. A big thing we want to do is offer the CECs because that will get people who are already certified by other things, especially ACSM, to want to take this as kind of a, a background to improve their, to get their CECs. And Kelly Vargo says she'd love to help if it's needed. Shoot me an email if you would. Thank you. Any other questions before I go get my screaming toddler from the other room? Thank you. I will pass it off to Bill. Well, thanks, Alan. I'm a little jealous of you uh, getting all the volunteers to sign up uh, before I started speaking. I, I need to, <laughs> I could use some volunteers as well. Uh, I, anyway, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think most of us are in the afternoon, unless you're in the mountain or uh, Western time zones. Uh, my name is Bill Cole. I uh, am a part of uh, the Physical Activity Alliance as the chair of the National Physical Activity Plan. Uh, I also, uh, when uh, I have one, another eye open, work as a professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston and the University of Texas at Austin uh, in, uh, as an epidemiologist, a professor of epidemiology. I want to go over uh, a little bit of uh, uh, what the National Physical Activity Plan is. I'm going to touch on a brief history, but it's a uh, critical part of this three-legged stool that we've brought together to uh, uh, create the Physical Activity Alliance. And it's something uh, when Lori the other day said, you know, we're reaching our one-year anniversary. Um, I was going to think, is it a birthday or an anniversary? I'm not entirely sure which is which, but it's hard to believe that uh, we've been around a year for now. And, and uh I think the physical activity plan, uh, uh, along with the other two organizations that have come together, the physical activity plan alliance, along with the other two organizations to come together to create the uh, physical activity alliance uh, in the last year has really, we've grown uh, to a point where uh, we're much better together than we were apart. And I'm looking forward to the next few years when we get the synergies of all three groups together towards uh, the vision of uh, a healthy and active uh, United States population. So uh, what is a physical activity plan? Those of you who don't know uh, the plan in, in, in of itself has been around really since about 2009 in one form or fashion. 
uh, but it's a comprehensive set of strategies. Uh, it, uh, it, it, to be some, to me, a public health priority, it can't just be declared as such. Uh, there has to be a plan to be able to attack it and tangible strategies, um, um, <clears throat> policies, practices, and even initiatives that are aimed at uh, increasing physical activity in the population. And that's uh, when Russ, those of you who may know Russ Pate was one of the key uh, uh, people to start this and is still very involved in the U.S. National Physical Activity Plan, uh, sought to uh, bring together in the early days in 2007, 2008. Next slide, please. Watching my time here. Uh, next slide. Quick history. Uh, beginning in 2007, uh, funding from CDC was uh, attained to begin the process, to commence the process of physical activity plan, uh, sought to establish public-private partnerships uh, in 2008 in the first, 2000, the first edition of the National Physical Activity Plan uh, took hold in 2010. Uh, beginning in 2013, uh, the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance became uh, a separate 501c3 program and uh, brought together partners uh, to a point uh, uh, that uh, uh, was able to, to grow and, and provide some support uh, for activities within the plan. The next five years saw multiple special projects. Uh, and in 2016, one of those special projects was what we call now uh, the National Physical Activity Plan 2.0 uh, that really brought together and matured the sector-based approach with strategies and tactics at various, for the various sectors, as well as, as, well as the overarching uh, public health priorities. And then happily, uh, the merger was initiated in 2019 with the National Coalition to Promote Physical Activity and the National Physical Activity Society, resulting in where we are today and, and last year, a year ago with a 2020 Physical Activity Alliance. Next slide, please. So we've, we're operating on the second edition or 2.0 as, as, uh, as, as the guiding document for uh, public health planning for physical activity promotion, which uh, was, came out in 2016. Next slide, please. The plan, some characteristics of the plan, I think, are really kind of critical. Uh, the, the, the plan uh, 1.0 as well as 2.0 plans were put together with a, an awful lot of uh, uh, partnership in, in uh, input uh, inherent in public health is partnership development and maintenance. And once the partners in each of the sectors uh, started to bring their priorities forward, there were themes that uh, emerged that uh, were cross-cutting. Uh, they weren't specific to one of the uh, uh, sectors of influence or uh, one or two or others. In other words, they kind of uh, were cross-cutting. And uh, what they have become, what the overarching priorities have become uh, for the plan have been uh, almost an umbrella, uh, an umbrella that uh, uh, is, is helpful to all of the sector-based uh, approaches for physical activity promotion. I've got them listed here. They include uh, working uh, to establish a physical activity and health office, a federal office at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that's specific to physical activity and health. Uh, work on building out a surveillance system. What we don't know is, is hurting us in this particular case. And uh, we have remarkably uh, inadequate data right now on uh, certainly sector specific approaches and, and participation, not just in physical activity participation, but policy surveillance, um, uh, environmental uh, support surveillance, other kinds of things that uh, we think can really expand our work because surveillance is a cornerstone of public health. Uh, reporting is critical. And uh, the first uh, set of physical activity report cards uh, uh, was published with uh, Peter Katzmarzik from Pennington Biomedical Research Center in the lead, and uh, that's kind of continuing. Where, where are we? What do we look like in each of these areas? Policy development, developing a physical activity campaign, which Lori talked about a little bit. Uh, importantly to me and to others also is state and local physical activity plans. The National Physical Activity Plan can give uh, guidance, can get, make a model, 
uh, but all health, I believe, is local and trying to apply uh, a national model to changes what happens in Texas or in West Virginia or Montana or so forth uh, is difficult. And so translation of the federal work to state and local levels is, I think, critical. Then, of course, increased funding for physical activity initiatives at federal, state, and local level is, are, is another initiative, uh, a priority. Next slide, please. Those of you who don't know, there are nine. There were nine sectors originally in a physical activity plan, uh, focusing on where the influence might be and where the evidence is that uh, these uh, these sectors can actually help make a difference. And as you can tell, here this list is fairly comprehensive. Importantly, each of us. Uh, I challenge each of us on the call today, but each of us interacts with multiple settings. Uh, throughout the course of our days and weeks as we as we live going through the transportation sector uh, to church or synagogue, uh, where we work, where our kids are educated and so forth. And so uh, these are these while these sectors have been identified as uh, important areas for influence and uh, particularly to develop strategies and tactics through those sectors, uh, they're not mutually exclusive and understanding how people move in and out of these sectors uh, can go, will go a long way to helping us attain uh, success with the National Physical Activity Plan. Next slide, please. Got a little bit of animation in this. So, uh, so you've got these overarching priorities here uh, that, as I said, create this umbrella and then the uh, 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 the various sectors that uh, create uh, and work other individual national plans. And uh, Monty indicated this originally. Uh, we have, since the physical activity plan was added, uh, uh, made the effort to create a, uh, an additional uh, sector because it crosses so much of uh, the United States population including dependents and families and retirees and reservists and things. And that's in the military sector. Uh, questions about military readiness and, and uh, uh, how uh, health can be promoted through this particular sector is also of key importance now uh, uh, to the National Physical Activity Plan and more to come as that, uh, as that sector gets off the ground with strategies and tactics. Next slide, please. And importantly, and if you don't take anything else away from what I'm saying today, importantly, it can lay out priorities, it can lay out all these sectors, but without specific uh, strategies and, and how to achieve those strategies, plans are rarely achieved. And so one of the strengths, I think, uh, to this plan, and it's a useful, it's a useful pattern, not just for things, not just for physical activity, but other public health uh, issues as well, uh, is, is how each sector uh, suggests you reach those strategies, you attain those strategies using those tactics. And so the overall plan, while it can fit on a nice PowerPoint slide uh, so forth, really goes into detail, a level of detail that uh, is, is, is remarkable in terms of evidence-based and evidence-informed uh, tactics to achieve strategies to integrate those uh, interactive or those uh, overarching uh, uh, themes uh, into uh, what we're trying to achieve. Next slide, please. Uh, most of these have been touched on uh, initially, but I just want to uh, highlight what we're doing as we kind of move into the Q&A section next, uh, we're doing currently. Uh, I think Lori was the one who talked about uh, improvement in surveillance, and that's one of the key things that uh, uh, we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we're trying to uh, move forward uh, to enhance surveillance in the United States. And happily, we developed a nice collaboration with the National Academy of Science and Medicine Physical Activity Innovation Collaborative, who also uh, declared their interest in uh, improving physical activity surveillance. Um, and uh, we are now nearing the end of uh, the first year of this work with four working groups to come back with uh, key uh, ideas uh, that will help uh, their work, um, uh, and they're no, not coincidentally four of our uh, sectors uh, that uh, uh, can be uh, assisted with uh, enhanced uh, surveillance and how to get to that particular 
point. Next slide, please. Uh, we just completed uh, phase one uh, of a study uh, on communicating physical activity messages to policymakers and the public, uh, conceptualizing, prioritizing, uh, strategizing, and so forth. Uh, that initial phase one dealt with uh, expert interviews, uh, scans, uh, 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 media, trying to understand the scope of the problem and, and informant to, uh, stakeholder interviews and so forth. The data and the results from phase one are moving into a phase two project. Uh, and uh, once funding secured for that, we'll be able to continue that on. But this is absolutely critical to things uh, Monty was talking about earlier in terms of communicating with legislatures, legislators, policymakers, and the like about the importance of uh, what we're dealing with. Next slide, please. Uh, recently, we, uh, under the initial, uh, under the, uh, 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 not initiative, I guess, uh, leadership from uh, Jane uh, Greenberg in Florida, uh, we were able to put together, she basically called me one day and said, uh, what are we gonna do post pandemic? Uh, with schools? Uh, what, what are the problems that we're going to have to be facing uh, with PE and other kinds of things? And, and uh, got me thinking to, that we really needed to uh, take a leadership role. So some of the first content that we've put together has to do with physical activity and COVID-19, but also physical activity in uh, preschool, uh, in elementary school, middle school, and high school, both uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, the, the preschool paper has been out uh, for a, a couple of months now, but uh, post uh, COVID, what does that look like? And so the other additional age groups uh, that um, are, uh, elementary, middle and high school uh, coming up here shortly in the next month or so, but dealing with what has to happen at, at schools post COVID to maintain and improve physical activity at school level. Next slide, please. Uh, Monty and, and others have also uh, indicated this, but uh, it's really exciting to add a 10th sector. I think uh, this shows, uh, this military setting, this shows that we, we think the plan, the plan can be flexible when there's a need to adjust, uh, to add additional sectors, uh, when there's uh, enough uh, will, if you will, to uh, among leaders in this. Uh, we can plug this into the, to the physical activity plan. And um, I, I, we're all anxious uh, to, to see this mature, the strategies and tactics for uh, uh, approaches in the military sector should be available uh, after July, uh, 2021. I'm not gonna, don't quote me on a, <laughs> on a time, on a, a deadline right now, but uh, they're, they're coming up quickly. And I know the group is working hard. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, in, in uh, 2026, it'll be 10 years under the Physical Activity Plan 2.0. And so what we're trying to do uh, is plan for a revision, uh, taking into account the special projects, uh, a key focus on diversity and inclusion and all the aspects of revision of the national plan. Uh, we're hoping uh, as we pull this forward to uh, roll a new plan out for 2026, maybe in the fourth quarter of 2026, uh, to keep things fresh, keep up with literature uh, uh, and, and, and things that, that uh, are moving forward. I will say that volunteers are certainly welcome. And if anyone's interested in helping work on uh, this part of uh, the National Physical Activity Plans uh, work plan to reach out, drop me an email, happy to visit about uh, where we might be able to plug you in. I believe that's my last slide. We can, yeah, we can transition now. Lori, I guess, are you moderating questions and answers? Or Monty? Uh, I think it was Lori, but uh, Lori, are you there? I am there, Monty. Sorry, I was still on double mute. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I also want to rely on uh, Ayana. She was going to help moderate the questions. But Nicole wanted us to speak about our work on health equity. And I just wanted to point out that we have a group of um, really wonderful members of the Alliance work on uh, a health equity statement for the Physical Activity Alliance. It is really interesting to be able to 
speak about how we're embedding our work and that will be coming soon. We look forward to having that uh, as a and as part of our communications uh, across everything that we do. Um, and I'm looking at a lot of thank yous coming in, Bill, for your presentation, uh, of course, and, and to everybody. So um, I'm just wondering if um, there are any other questions. We're glad to answer them. I don't see any readily in the Q&A, but I want to help me if I'm missing any. No, we don't have any new questions. No open questions. Great. I guess I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Just want to reiterate, there are just so many different ways that you could join us in this work. We need everybody uh, kind of pulling together and um, contributing to the work of the Alliance. And, and that's what this is all about. So if you have, um, you know, if any part of the presentation really interested you today and you want to try to plug in, as Bill said, or Alan said, um, or Monty said, in any part of the work that we're doing, please reach out. We're obviously also looking for organizational leadership level commitments to the Alliance. So please stay in touch with us. And um, I know Anna would love to hear from you as well and she can make um, connections for anybody. And then Joel has asked if the slides will be available. Anna, and I'm assuming that we'll be sending those out after, after the presentation today. Yes, the slides and the presentation will both be available. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. I hope you have a great rest of the day, a wonderful week, and we look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining.